Welcome back to the exciting sequel to the inaugural Hogwarts Dropout broadcast. I'm glad to see that you've tuned back in. I'm Matt Muggletain, a voted most Hufflepuff student two years running, and joining me as ever is my co-host Reba. Hi, I'm Reba. I am extreme. I'm frighteningly Ravenclaw. I need to be smarter than everyone else at all times. I'm also very quirky, and I'm not like other girls. Ah. <laughs> my problem is well, uh, being most Hufflepuff doesn't mean you're exactly like the other boys is the issue. <laughs> Hufflepuff, you are exactly like all Hufflepuffs if you are Hufflepuff. <laughs> Ravenclaw is... Well, they, they actually, they, they don't quite go into it, but here it's like, with the, for those in, with wit and learning, which just means you're a smart ass and you know things. This is the podcast where uh, Matt, a, myself, a British person who has never read Harry Potter and is only sort of vaguely aware of it through cultural osmosis, and Reba, who is an American who is very much a fan, uh, go through yes. the books in... A block of chapters until we have read all of them. <laughs> so far, uh, last episode we covered uh, the boy who lived through Keeper of the Keys, right? Yeah, which is the first four chapters. Uh, and I, I prepared a little. This is something that would become more as we move on through the books, and there is more story to cover. This bit will get more selective and useful as before the previously on Harry Potter. For this one, it's very, like, not much is it, like, the not a ton has happened so far, or what's happened is very basic and most people already know. Previously on Harry Potter, we had the story of a boy named Dudley Dursley. <laughs> one day, <laughs> Dudley Dursley, Dursley is a kid growing up in suburban England, and one day Dudley gets a new cousin deposited on his parents' doorstep when he and the cousin are both one year old. His cousin is named Harry Potter, and Harry Potter doesn't have parents anymore, and nobody else wants him, and so he's going to live with, the du with Dudley's family now. And for the first time in his life, Dudley has some competition for his parents' affection, but luckily, his parents don't like Harry very much, and so Dudley always wins. Dudley gets Ataris and gold watches and two bedrooms all, all to himself, while Harry has to live in a cupboard and cook, and cook Dudley breakfast. It's great. Things are the same at school, where, in spite of being overweight and not very good with books, Dudley is a popular Chad, while Harry is an uncool weirdo. <laughs> Dudley and his friends have a lot of fun chasing Harry around and beating him up. It's not always easy having a cousin. Harry is a bit of a smartass, and he often says some and he often says things that Dudley can't quite understand to make fun of him. And weird things will sometimes happen when Dudley and Harry fight. Strange and sometimes scary things, things that don't really make sense and always make their parents quite cross with Harry afterwards. Then one day, Harry starts getting mysterious letters from a place called Hogwarts. This is the weirdest and most not making sense thing yet. Nobody likes Harry, and so there's no one who would want to write to him. Dudley's parents don't let Harry or Dudley read the letters, which is a big deal since usually if Dudley wants something, they let him have it. The letters keep coming and coming through the windows and the chimney, and eventually Dudley's dad decides to take the family out of the house. They drive for days, trying to escape the letters, but the letters keep following them. Then Dudley's dad takes the family to a little hut on a rock in the middle of a lake, somewhere the letters will surely never be able to follow them. But then something worse does. A terrifying giant named Hagrid breaks down the door of the hut. He's got another letter for Harry and a birthday cake. He tells Harry he's a wizard, he's not normal, and he needs to go to a special school where he can learn how to do more frightening and weird things. The giant says some very mean things to Dudley's family, and when Dudley's father tries to stand up for them, the giant attacks Dudley with magic and gives him a piggy tail. Dudley ran out of the room at that point, and he didn't hear the rest of what the giant said, but he gets the gist of what's happened. His weird, annoying, and pathetic cousin is going to a place for scary weirdos like him. And that's what happened last on Harry Potter. So, while we appreciate that you all are very eager to find out what happens with Dudley next, uh, we're going to take a brief... <laughs> interlude to follow up on what happens to that weirdo harry kid yes yeah we, we have a brief interlude which will be the rest of the book so we pick things up in chapter five and yeah uh, as we've recapped harry has received his letter to hogwarts and hagrid has taken him on a day trip to get his school supplies like these next we're covering right we're going to be covering the next three chapters diagon alley uh, Hogwarts Express, or Platform 9 and 3 quarters is what it's called, but it's basically like the Hogwarts Express chapter, and then the sorting ceremony. 
And between these three, these are three very like expository heavy chapters, which is you being introduced to the wizarding world. And just kind of from the go, it's just this torrent of new information. Like just every every page, every other sentence, there's new things and new concepts that are being imparted to the reader. Like the first thing is that we have, you're introduced to the concept of owls, owls delivering the post. And the owl needs to be paid for the post. And it's just, it's this weird thing. It's very brief and it's not dwelt upon. And that's kind of like this, this we, we are on the, the, the Harry Potter Express and this train does not have brakes. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, yeah, we, like Reba said, we start with Harry attempting to extort labor out of an owl without payment, <laughs> like the rat he is. However, uh, Hagrid like tells him to have a look through his coat and explains, again, just offhandedly, like, oh yeah, give us some knuts. And we it, are left to wonder what a knut is. Is that how you would pronounce it? I'm not... I. It's been one of the more awkward things to write as someone who's written Harry Potter fan fiction. Uh, or something to have, have accidental puns about the fact that their lowest form of currency is called a nut. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I, I'll be honest, if I called it a nut, I think I would just be sitting here giggling for the whole pod. But I can't yeah, do that so let, let's prefer. say they're canuts. I always, in my head, pronounced it nut because I, like, I knew how things like that are usually pronounced <laughs> at that age. But yes. But yeah, um, uh, Hagrid sort of like tells Harry where they're going to be going. He's taking him from the Dursleys, and they are going to head to yeah, get his school supplies, and also do a little bit of business for Dumbledore. We sort of establish here that Hagrid like. He's kind of a Hogwarts Uber Eats guy. Like, he just kind of does whatever they need him to do. <laughs> That's a good way to describe it, yeah. he's If Dumbledore was evil, Hagrid would be, like, his stooge or his minion. But Dumbledore is good, question mark. And so Hagrid's, like, a, pos- a mi- minion non-derogatory. <laughs> a goon non-derogatory. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's an interesting little characterization where Hagrid seems really proud of this job he has where he's just running errands, which I kind of found interesting just in his own right. Kind of speaks yeah. to him having like this very, very deep respect for Dumbledore. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's sort of like, it. it's a servant kind of relationship, but I think it's more just like Hagrid, you, how, how much of Hagrid's backstory have you gotten yet? Or sort of like what his deal is? Uh, in this chapter, we get, like, a little bit of it, but really not so much. Okay, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it it does mention that he was expelled. And so he's not, I think there's, yeah, he, there's a limit to what he can do legally as a wizard. And so still being able to be part of the community and working for Dumbledore, who's this very important and prestigious person, is something like that. It's a point of pride for him. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a little thing of, like, Hagrid only ever tries to use magic sneakily when no one else is around or when only Harry's around and has to ask him not to rat him out for it. They head over, we are introduced to one of the in-universe papers, the Daily Prophet. Um, Hagrid has a complaint about politics to this 11-year-old, which felt very real. Yes, and I, I like the detail in there where Harry has learned not to bother people while they're reading the paper because of Uncle Vernon. This is a thing that's like Harry's entire world, uh, like how he his in his narration describes everything in relationship to the Dursleys because they are pretty much his only point of reference. Um, like it goes into how he's never. I think where they live uh, is Surrey, which correct oh, me if God. I'm wrong. Is that okay? What what is Surrey? Uh, let's just make sure I'm going to be correct in what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. So, Surrey is part of what's called the home counties in the UK, which are a... Basically, they're like a series of counties that directly border London, and they have, like, an influx of people who are pretty wealthy in them, while not being, like, quite as urban. And yeah. A lot of it also comes from the fact that these are people who, through, um, there's a scheme under Thatcher where basically you could go for, you could buy your own council house that you've been living in. And that, for a lot of people, like, who didn't have that much money, yes, suddenly they were sort of part of this, like, mini gentry almost. 
Oh. And a lot of these people now live in the home counties. It's the sort of person who will say they have like a white Range Rover with a working class license plate on it, right? Mm hmm. So, yeah, like Surrey is kind of the perfect place for the Dursleys to be from because they're sort of this like aspirational, like quite venomous middle class, which, yeah, is pretty characteristic of a lot of people who live in that sort of area. Yeah, uh, okay. Or at least, you know, that the, is the, the negative stereotype, at least. Yeah, that is about the vibe I get from, like, the close, like, I think the analog in America is like, you know, white suburbanites who fled the inner cities, the whole white, like, people are, who are there because of the whole white flight thing, people who Ooh. are living in places that were constructed for white people to be, as opposed to, like, you know, the urban jungle where the poor black people are. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's similar, but more, more so along, like, uh, class divides than racial divides. Yeah, and certain, so this is... What I was getting to is that I, I had looked this up before, like, where Surrey is. And what I'm mostly taking is just like, oh, it's basically a suburb of London. Mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. means, so Harry says, when they go when they go into London, he says in his, narr in his internal narr narration, he has never been to London itself. He has lived in Surrey his entire life, 11 years, and he has never been to London. And... That kind of shows you, like, just how tiny his world has been, how, like, cloistered he has been. Um, yeah, especially when England is just not a large country. Yeah, yeah, like, he, he's, he, he lives in Surrey, he's never been to London. He does know how to navigate the train, though. Like, mm. I wonder, that, that, I wonder if that's, like, I wonder where he learned how to do that if he's never been to London, to I... do that on his own. I, I sort of took that as, like, the characterization of Harry's already quite independent. He is used to fending for himself and having to figure things out for himself. Yeah, that's probably, that's the, I think that, that tracks, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, sort of, that's, that's a whole sequence of, like, Hagrid, uh, <laughs> making fun of muggles and pointing at random shit while they head, <laughs> head on the train, head on the train into, uh, London. Um, they also bring up at this point... I just want to highlight this as, like, a beautiful English name. Uh, the Minister of Magic, Cornelius Fudge. Uh, you do not meet him in this book, but you will in later oh. books. You will meet Cornelius Fudge. What does that name sound like to you? What kind of a man do you think this is? Um, Especially with how he's described, sort of, like, quite ineffectual fancy life. <laughs> Yeah, that's these are all good descriptions of it. that is all like yes uh names are very like this is one thing that's both good and bad about rowling depending on how what she's using her powers for but rowling is is very capable at making a, evocative names that kind of tell you most of what you need to know about a person when you first hear them mm. uh it is it, it, it's a talent and it is uh well later on we're gonna there, there's a bit where I, I is i think an example of using the power for evil um but it, it, it's 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 a talent coming up with names that's sort of like oh cornelius fudge that is exactly i i already know most of what i need to understand about this person <laughs> i've never even met them yeah exactly it, it's like it is i think very much like kids book shorthand but i do just enjoy it even as an adult just because that's a fun name yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so we get to... So basically they arrive on like a seemingly innocuous King London Street and Harry isn't really sure like, well, where are we supposed to be going from here? We're buying a bunch of wizard stuff, but these are just like, prats. Like, <laughs> what's going on? But Hagrid points out a pub called the Leaky Cauldron that it seems like they're the only people on the street you can see. And that's kind of a running thing with wizardy stuff, is it almost exists in, like, liminal space. Where, like... Yeah. We get this again later on with the platform uh, Nine and Three Quarters, where, like, wizardy stuff tends to exist in places you pass through and you wouldn't think to stop and have an examine of. Yeah. It's a very uh, Douglas Adamsy y thing, uh, mm. where... Like, have you read... Um... The Hitchhiker's Guide? I've read Hitchhiker's Guide. I haven't read the whole series. Okay, I know that there is a thing 
where there's like a weirdness filter concept in there where people will just kind of ignore something if it's too weird or like there's i forget if, it, if it's an actual thing if it's like can be put over something like a weirdness bubble where people will ignore it uh but yeah that's kind of there's a similar logic at play with how the wizards are able to be in hiding um i think that there is like th there is magic involved with that like i know there's lore about how like hogwarts it's, it's itself if a muggle tried to approach it they just see a bunch of old ruins with like caution tape signs around it and it wouldn't look like anything that you should be near to them and they probably and mm. then they also like suddenly like realize oh i left the, the stove on and feel a need to go away um and that's that's a magical those are magical illusions but in the case of but there is a kind of like because of the way that Harry Potter characterizes muggles and sort of understands like the normals versus the weirdos, the normals don't really want to notice the weird shit. They don't really want, like there's things in our lives that we just kind of walk past and don't notice or think about or really want to think about because it's yeah. not, you know, the interesting new things or, you know, so that's the wizards can kind of like, it's, it's a matter of magic, but it's also kind of a matter of just, uh, like social social psychology in a way. Yeah, they have described the pub itself as being like pretty fucking ratty looking. Yeah. As well. Um, but yeah, they like head inside and encounter a bunch of wizards having a drink. And Hagrid Hagrid knows all of them. He's like a regular. And he also introduces them all to Harry. And they're all fawning over him. Falling over each other sort of thing. Mm-hmm. We sort of established, we established a little bit before, but yeah, Harry by this point is like a household name. Everyone knows Harry Potter. Yeah. Uh, and these wizards who like presumably have years and years on him, including um, one of his future professors, Quirrell. Yeah, they're all sort of falling over each other at this 10 year old's feet. Which is, I think, interesting in sort of like where it puts Harry at the start of the story. Um... Well, sorry, versus where Harry is at the start of the story. But even now, he still hasn't quite set off on the whole journey yet. He's still kind of early days. And I like how... I think it's an interesting angle to go with. That he's famous? Yeah, that he's already well-known, but he hasn't really done anything. Yeah, and it's... Like, it's, it's kind of, like, the inverse of what his situation had been before, where he was nobody, he lived in a cupboard, he was, it's it's Cinderella, and then he arrives in the Wizarding World, and, like, it, it's all these things at once. It is, there's a whole world out there, and you have, it, like, you're, you're suddenly very rich, because your parents, who you thought hadn't left you anything, did leave you tons of money. You're rich, you're famous, you're a wizard, it's all of these things. And only some of that Harry actually wants or likes. Mm. Uh, like, he doesn't... The fact that he has money in itself is... It's cool to have money, but it's mostly cool because of the things you can get with it. And, like, the social things you can do with it. Not so much just because, like, he, he always wanted to be rich. And being famous is not really a something he sees as a boon at all and he kind of he's very discomforted by it in part because it's like he's famous for something that he doesn't he, he didn't really do uh like he, or he wasn't conscious of doing it's just kind of like you're inherently famous yeah uh i think that the the thing where he doesn't like being famous i think it derives from the same place that sort of like the core of his character comes from which is that harry has been starved of feeling like he belongs anywhere. Mm. Like, this is a fundamental human need. Humans are social creatures. We want to be part of groups in, in one way or, or another. And when you're denied that, it kind of, it does things to you because it's not, it's kind of an unnatural state to be in. And Harry has been starved of that feeling like he belongs somewhere. He's been told all his life that he does not belong where he is. And now all of a sudden he's given this, like, here, there's a place for you, there's a place where you can belong. And that idea is the greatest idea in the world to him. And these three chapters are him being introduced to that place and sort of being shown that it doesn't come without some caveats. Yeah. And one of the caveats is being famous. 
And being famous is another way that he's kind of set apart from this new from this new community. Like it's they all know who he is. They like him in the, like they like the concept of him, but it's it like I think Hagrid says that he it singles him out. And it's kind of like the other side of the coin. Like you can be singled out because everyone thinks that you're you're weird and they hate you, or you can be singled out because everyone thinks you're awesome and you know, you're a spotlight's gonna be on you that way. In in both Ooh. cases, you're not really part of the group. And that's what he desperately wants. Yeah, and I also think there's very much like a self consciousness, uh, which obviously is like very common in tween ages, but especially I think because of his background, you read in Harry, where he is always, always, always obsessed with how people are seeing him and perceiving him, and is very careful about what he says and what he does. Yes. Yeah, this is, you finally get to, after, you know, four, three or four, three chapters of you, you are just, you are Harry Potter living in Dudley Dursley's world. We finally get to like properly see Harry's character and spend mm. some time with him as a person in a way that we didn't quite before. And I I enjoyed it a lot. Like there's like he's a he's like people he often gets criticized or sort of thrown into the bin of like your everyman protagonists. And he is. He is an everyman protagonist, but I think he's a very like detailedly drawn one like he's very very relatable and he's good as an audience avatar but he does like have his own he he is a solid character there is a thing here there's yeah. a person here that you know is is doing has thoughts and has opinions and is and is motivated in a very tangible way so yes um, then we sort of slide past that scene, like, we find the brick wall at the back of the Leaky Cauldron, where Hagrid casts a particular spell on it, and it reveals this, like, portal, again, kind of like a space in between things, where Diagon Alley exists. And they walk out, and Harry is, like, overwhelmed by just all this magical shit fucking everywhere, including the detail of, like, we get more into the weird magic world currency, where, you know, mm -hmm. you just hear sort of the general chatter you might hear at a market stall, but with this weird wizardy shit. And it does make me think about this might be the way real life Britain goes uh, once we <laughs> undecimal the <laughs> currency <laughs> and go back to shillings. Oh, what? I don't I don't know much about. So what do you mean go back to the shilling? Oh, okay. So currently we have like a decimalized currency. It's pounds and pennies. A pound tends to be roughly equal to a dollar, and a penny is a hundredth of a pound. Mm -hmm. We used to have a very complicated system with like shillings and pence and pounds and different denominations of like those different currencies had their own special names. Oh, so it's, so it is a bit like... The, the wizard currency. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's deliberately, like, a bit of old-fashionedness was trying to be evoked there. <gasps> okay, interesting. But yeah, so this is post-apocalyptic Britain, is we're going around talking about, you know, sh shillings and canuts again. Although it's kind of funny, because, like, at the time of this book setting, 1991, they hadn't, they, I think they'd only really, only recently stopped using shillings and shit. We used those for a long time. Oh, interesting. I and was that like a whole? I, I assume that was like a whole thing when it when it changed over. Yeah, but it's also part of like uh, England has a strange attachment to the imperial measurement system. Yes, like here we're imperial. I don't remember why. I f I think that's just because we we had it and then we were we we stuck with it out of American spite. Uh, I know that the wizards use the imperial system. It gives it all a slightly old-fashioned but not like as old-fashioned feeling it makes the wizard world feel like it's kind of 30 years behind almost mm. okay interesting yeah, it's interesting not then we head to gringotts uh to pick up harry's money and we have something we need to discuss here unfortunately let's discuss it yeah this is this is one of the the things which need be discussed of Harry Potter. So let's let's discuss it. Let's let's what your impression of this situation. Gringotts is a bank, uh, which is the most secure one in the world, and I presume like the only one in Wizarding Britain, 
which is run by yes. goblins, who are given the description of swarthy, clever-faced, with pointed beards, very long fingers and feet. Um, yes. For those of you who are not aware, quite a few of those like descriptors and in general, like the idea we have of a goblin in pop culture has quite a lot of anti-Semitic connotations. Yes. And especially when you get into the idea of them being bankers, yeah, it starts straying into territory, which I think you would be reasonable to call just, yeah, outright anti-Semitic. Yeah. It's something that was honestly worse in the movies, unfortunately, as well. Yes, I, w- I was going to say this, which is... When you, okay, like in the books, that very, that description you just gave is, I think, I, I was paying attention this time to, to like clock it, but that little, that short description, the swarthy, clever face, long fingers and feet, that is, I think, the only description you get in the goblins yes. this entire chapter. You just get that little nugget. And the god, like, so. Some of the things that people will point out is like, oh, the goblins have hooked noses and things and these kind of distorted features. That is has not been described in the books so far when we meet them. Oh. That is that comes from the way that they're depicted in the movies. That image of the goblin with this kind of face and the big nose and all that that looks kind of like an anti-Semitic caricature. Yeah. That is that that's more movies than books. Given how it's kind of achieved a mimetic status on the internet, the goblins are anti-Semitic caricatures. I was going in this into this expecting it to be a lot worse than it kind of was, is as far as the text of the books. Like it's almost I kind of want to throw it in the bin as like the crows from Dumbo, where it like it bad on its face, it bad as a premise, having your banks run by inhuman creatures. Mm. And them being sort of like this separate race of things that are kind of short and have swarthy features. Like, all of this is bad. But it is, like, you, you compare it to other things going on. It, like, even within these books, like, the way that Rowling will get so venom- venomous about Dudley's weight and never stop talking about it. The goblins are not, like, lingered on in that same way. And so that makes me, it doesn't seem like a hatefully motivated thing. And there's one trait that the goblins have that is very, like, almost pointedly the inverse of anti-Semitic canards, where, like, the, the most common one is the, the greedy Jew, that concept. Uh, mm-hmm. And the goblins are very pointedly ungreedy. In fact, greed is something that they culturally abhor to the point where they have that very foreboding poem outside of the bank that threatens you if you're a thief and would steal from them. Uh, and it's kind of like, like this is the reason why the goblins run like run the banks is because they are very like they're very secure. You can't steal from them because they will fuck your shit up. And so that like that's. And like I said, it's crows from Dumbo. The premise of it is bad on its face, but it is like going by. It's it's not as bad as I was expecting to be. I think it, there might be it might get worse with later books as she becomes more aware of like, oh, I'm kind of doing a thing here. And then she decides to instead of backpedal, lean into the skid of it and try to make a thing about it. And that's oh. when it gets quite bad. Um, yeah, um, I think I would agree with you in that. The way they are described to me speaks, and it's difficult to say this as like two white people, um, but the way it's described to me speaks more to kind of unconsciously recreating the kind of like racist archetypes we have in our head, more yes. than like deliberate malice. It speaks more to me of like when we imagine a character or a fictional race in a certain way, we ascribe characteristics to them that yeah, are associated with, like, these negative stereotypes that we are exposed to culturally. And I think it, it's not as bad as I expected, however, it's pretty it's pretty easy to see how, like, the archetype that was being described here was then picked up by the movies and exaggerated and furthered in the direction that we can already kind of see of being, like, an anti-Semitic yeah. caricature. Yeah, and especially, like, the way that they're described in the books where they're wearing, like, uh, 
red and gold robes and things mm. gives them this very kind of otherworldly, like like they're magical creatures. In the movies, they're wearing suits, and that makes them more like grotesque yeah. humans rather than magical creatures. You know? Yeah. So I think, um, I think there's other stuff which is coming up, which is. Probably stuff I personally have more of an issue with, although we'll have to see how it plays out in text. Mm. But yeah, I think I agree with people who take issue with this. Of like, I definitely see where they're coming from. I think I can see like where these unconscious biases have started to leak in and how they've affected the text. I have, uh, I actually have a headcanon fairy thing about this. Oh yeah, go for it. Yeah, so my he- this headcanon fairy is when Reba gives you. Re- Reba curated lore this c- of like ways to reconcile aspects of the Harry Potter series that don't make sense where instead of going like cinnamon sins and saying like these are plot holes it's like no these are moments where we can just kind of wave a magical wand of headcanon and make it all like function um so with the goblins the goblins are hard to deal with because just like the way that they are written the how they are baked into the text is a problem and so the way that i deal this is like my gift to anyone who is listening and wants to write fan fiction or wants to like do their own things with this universe and has to work with this concept of the banking goblins so uh my how i fix the goblins is uh so the modern wizarding banking system is a compromise after centuries of horribly violent conflict between wizards and goblins over precious minerals, which mostly revolved around wizards stealing goblin gold and jewels and the goblins retaliating viciously. This is taken from, you'll you'll sort of, you'll, you'll, it's, it gets alluded to when you learn about wizard history that goblins and wizards have had a lot of bloody conflict. Uh, Gringotts, like all banks, is a human creation and it is managed by humans. The gold and silver and other precious metals are mined by the goblins. And goblins consider all precious metals from their mines to be on loan to wizards via the banking system, Mm. in a sense. Like, they don't have the same concept of ownership that we have. The person who owns something is the person who mined it, not the person who currently has it or paid for it. And so all they see all money as kind of theirs, in a sense, because it came from their mine. And the goblins at Gringotts are overseeing the transactions to ensure a fair exchange of goods, to make sure that no goblin gold is being stolen. But all the intra-wizard finances, like, you know, the, the, the stuff that is the, the bones of the economy for these people, all of that is fully wizard controlled. It's not controlled by the goblins in the conspiratorial sense. Now, the notion that the banks are run by goblins, is a conspiracy theory common among the Christian-majority wizards in Britain. It is such an endemic belief that many Gentile wizards simply treat goblin control of the banks as a fact of life. Like, Hagrid just says it, like, this is just the thing that everybody knows, the goblins run the banks. And they he would be surprised if you told him that this was a hateful concept. But to be clear, the belief is anti-goblin and also a form of displaced anti-Semitism. And so you can, with, like... You you sort of like you move down the thing like in you you treat it as in universe the idea that the goblins run the banks is a, is a racist idea and it is both an, it is anti semitic in universe and it is also anti goblin oh. and so like racism against Jewish humans kind of bled into speciesism against goblins in like that's like complicated topic that is largely omitted from Gentile history courses that prefer to imagine the wizarding world as racism-free. Uh, Jewish wizards and goblin communities have little to do with each other directly and have always been mutually insulted by these by the association with each other. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of my solution. You just treat it as like, in-universe, this is a conspiracy theory and is just kind of a fact of life to the Christian majority wizards. But Jewish wizards w- like would understand that this is... This is a this is a an, a dis, this is a kind of displaced anti-Semitism. Interesting. Not to be out nerded, but the stuff about um, the idea of like gold belonging to the nation or community that mined it rather than who currently owns it actually does remind me of like medieval economics. There was this idea of mercantilism, where yeah, money was to remain within one kingdom. 
you weren't really it was bad it was thought to be bad form to trade gold away to different countries interesting that is i had no idea about that but that completely makes sense uh-huh. with because okay so the the thing that i just said with uh the goblins considering precious metals to be on loan that's that's not something i invented that's something that 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 does that is gone into a bit in later books when the goblins are explored more I don't know if exploring the goblins was a great idea. But they did it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but we did we should it. have let that one lie. And so now we're living with it. But yeah, that that concept, I do like that idea because to me it seemed kind of uh like, oh, they have a very different value system than any humans, like Christian or Jewish. They're they have a very like other they have a different way of conceptualizing ownership and material things than we mm. do. Uh, but that's interesting that there that this was kind of a medieval way of understanding things, which would track because I think like the thing that we're, we're kind of un- realizing as we read, which I, I mean, I knew, but I think that as you read with an adult eye, you can kind of see like how much of a medieval history nerd Rowling is. Yes. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so I think that's uh, I think that's about as much as can be said about the goblins at this point yeah um, a bit of a lengthy diatribe but it felt like we kind of had to dig into that one or else it would be an elephant in the room no yeah yeah, yeah. it is definitely because like, it, it has this medic status as one of the things to like lob at rowling in tweets and whatnot that like mm-hmm. oh and you make the goblins into anti-semitic caricatures and it's like not wrong and not not wrong and so we're we're gonna talk about this and be Again, like I believe in being accurate when it comes to what this, what these, what the situation here is, and so yeah, so so this is a more like very very thorough, uh, like analysis of what the goblin situation is. Yeah, um, we sort of get like a little bit of like we 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 again like my theory that the whole Canut sickles galleons was the last one. Galleons, galleons are the top. Yeah, my whole theory with that being like a parody of like old fashioned currency comes back again because when Hagrid is showing Harry his own vault at Gringotts, he explains that the exchange rate is, I think, 17 canuts to a sickle and 29 sickles to a galleon, which is fucked. (laughs) It is fucked. Oh my god, that's the worst exchange rate possible. Jesus. Yeah, some people, I'm not an economics person, but there is, uh, there, there, there are jokes made at different points where people have managed to calculate what the exchange rate between wizard gold and real money is, Ooh. and what the value of wizard gold versus gold in muggle land is, and it's a whole situation, and it's not really good for the wizards. Like, if these are, these economies come crashing back together, it's not going to be a fun time. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there's a lot that you can do to kind of play around with that. And people have in fan fiction. Um, but, yeah. Um, and then we sort of get, like, a, a, little, a little sort of foreshadowing scene of Hagrid picking up a parcel on behalf of Dumbledore that is, like kept under sort of max max security which i can only assume is dumbledore's copy of nuts uh for that moment <laughs> okay i okay you know it's hard to get lad lads mags in, in a hog quarters you have to smuggle them in <sighs> okay anyways we leave gringotts and now it's time for like a story trope that i always love which is the, like shopping spree Yes. In this new fun world. So it we is... first we first Oh by the go... way, so a thing I just want to note here. I was gonna do this earlier, but we kind of went over it. But so Diagon Alley. Uh we, we we're so used to that name at this point that I don't think we think about it twice so much anymore. Or at least I didn't for a while. But you you, you get the pun with Diagon Alley, right? Not at all. You don't get okay, I'm glad we're doing this then. Diagon Alley is a pun. Take, take out the upper case letter, put the two words together. What word is this? Uh, diagonally. Like horizontally, uh, diagonally, diagon alley. 
Uh... I feel like that's... I, I, yeah, this is important because I want us to remember what level we're at. This is Phantom Tollbooth. This is Wizard of Oz. Diagon Alley. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I didn't even... Jesus. I feel like dumb now. I'm, yeah, you just... Oh, and yeah, and later on, the, it doesn't come up in this book. The, the second part of the joke is uh, there's a, a diff, there's another alley for dark art stuff. That one is called Nocturne Alley. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, anyways, first stop on the shopping spree is uh, to get Harry's cloak fitted. And that would be uneventful if it weren't for him beating another little boy named Draco Malfoy. And we get, like, an interesting conversation here where Draco is, like, a pretty friendly boy. He, like, he's kind of talking over Harry like little kids do, but he wants to know, like, oh, are you going to Hogwarts too? Are you into Quidditch? What house do you think you'll be in? Like, he's just making polite conversation. But yeah. things turn a bit ugly when Hagrid shows up and Draco starts insulting him. Harry takes offense to that. And I think that's, like interesting in that Draco only through just barreling through this conversation has managed to offend Harry. Um, yeah. Which does kind of feel like, honestly, like, that is kind of how it is with kids. How they just kind of parrot shit their parents say, and can often end up saying something, you know, parroting something offensive or hurtful. Because he says a lot of shit about Hagrid that he clearly has just heard from his parents. Yeah, like he, like he's saying, like I don't think, like he's saying things like I don't think this, but like how would you? You're eleven. You don't think anything. You are repeating things that your father, you've heard your father or mother say. Like basically everything you 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 just said with that interaction, is it's quite nuanced in its way. Like you could like for what this character is, like he's gonna be. This is Draco Malfoy. He's everybody's favorite racist twink, and. He is gonna be like the bully, the rival, the antagonist, the 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 Gary from Pokemon <laughs> of the <this> story. <laughs> and he is you could have him just be a complete shit from the word go to solidify that. But like he he he's he's like a person and he just has like as you talk to him or as he talks at you, these shitty beliefs just kind of flow out of him. Mm. And that's what turns out off Harry. And, like, later on, we'll see, like, on the Hogwarts Express, when he meets him again, he's again, like, trying to put his best foot forward. He's like, I'm happy to be friends with you. And Harry's like, you're kind of a shit. And I don't want to be friends with you. And, yeah. like, from Draco's perspective, you can see how it's like, I don't know what I did wrong here. <laughs> What's also kind of funny in this segment is... Between both Draco's, like, prejudices coming forth, but also what Hagrid says when Harry's, like, complaining about what he said to him later, we get we get the first bits of Hufflepuff being the joke house. Yes, we do. Uh... Which is something I hadn't realised. I thought that was, like, an entirely fandom joke, because, like, <laughs> yeah, it's just got kind of a silly name. But no, as early as Chapter 4, we are ragging on Hufflepuff. It is... Okay, I do, this is an aspect of the world building. I like it, but it does, like, it, so there's other ways you could have done this story where, you know, you have this setup where you have these different houses that different characters can be a part of. You have these different threads of identity. And this is very appealing to kids. The houses are a genius creation in, in the same way that, like, Homestuck blood types are and everything in Homestuck is really. But, you know, it's like Avatar elemental powers. Everybody has, like, their thing, and you can slot yourself into it. And you could have written the version of this story mm. where Harry's friends all come from different houses, and you have that kind of diversity in the group. But that's not, the, that's not how this was done. Gryffindor is the best one because it has the traits that Rowling considers to be the good ones, which is, like, bravery and chivalry and, you know, the, Gryffindor is the hero house. And then you have Ravenclaw with the with the uh, the smart the 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 clever kids. You have Hufflepuff with the the boring hard workers, and you have Slytherin with the racist shits. And it's not really meant to be like yeah, this is not a young adult novel. This is more 
like an allegorical thing. I don't know. It's it's not like the, if you if you were thinking about this, putting together a series like this, you would want to have like oh, you have someone with the earth powers, you have someone with fire powers, you have someone with water powers, you have you have people from all straits here, mm. you have all the different blood types in your homestuck, but that's not what was done. And so all, everyone who's a, everyone who's on our team is pretty much in Gryffind from Gryffindor. Uh, whether or not that quite yeah. makes sense strictly for their character, we'll I'll I'll get into I'll, we're we're gonna get into the fucking sword and hat when we get to it. Yeah, the other thing is like again between what House Malfoy wants to be in and also from what Hagrid says, we also establish that Slytherin is the house for dicks. Yeah, and that is. I, I don't mind Slytherin being the house for dicks necessarily. I think you you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that kind of reflects boarding school culture where this is like yeah. you have one house that's where all the people that become politicians come from. And <laughs> like <laughs> and it's like, oh, everyone who joins the, the Teddy Roosevelt Club or the Phoenix Club, like they're all going to rule the world someday. And that's where all like the, the elitist shits go, because that's who gets to be in the club. And that's kind of like what Slytherin I mean, with boarding schools, it's kind of like, a private school, it's kind of like the house for dickheads is all of them. <laughs> Another thing, sorry, this is, this is like, Reba tangents the episode. <laughs> go off. Hagrid is your, is your main guide through the wizarding world, or through Diagon Alley, and Harry doesn't ever get, like, an objective view on any of the wizarding world. Like he, mm, like mm. the perspective of Hagrid, the things that Hagrid tells him are like level one wizarding world information, but it's not the whole story. It's kind of like how people talk about like the way that things were explained to you when you were, uh, you know, in 11 or in kindergarten about how the world works. That's not really how the world works. That's just like the the basic, that's, that's level one teaching you about things. And so that's kind of the role that Hagrid serves, where he says, like, why are the wizards in hiding? His answer to that yes. question uh, yeah. is, oh, we're in hiding because if we weren't, then they'd be, muggles would be bothering us for spells. <laughs> and we don't want that. And it's like, that is, like, to an adult reading this, that is obviously not the real reason. Yeah. But that is just kind of what you need to scoot past that question because it's too big to begin to answer. Uh there's an interesting thing here in that, like, both for the characters who are quite young and the readers who are quite young, the adults in Harry Potter are already kind of speaking, like, not entirely telling the whole truth. Like, they'll say things and there's like kind of a, a secondary reason that they won't allude to that is a bit more sinister. Like when Dumbledore is talking about why he's dropping off Harry with the Dursleys. Yeah. Yeah, and Hagrid, like, Hagrid's opinion that the Hufflepuffs are a load of duffers, like, he's, like, Hagrid's angle, like, Hagrid was in Gryffindor, and so he has that opinion, and that's his bias. And it's not, you you do kind of come away with, like, you don't really have a Hufflepuff's opinion ever in the, like, in, in this beginning bit on their side of the, like, you, you don't have evidence that Hufflepuffs are not a load of duffers, but Hagrid is not really a reliable narrator as a general thing. Like, yeah, like it feels realistic that he's not mm. getting the perfectly objective view of this world from anybody. Uh, just sort of speeding through the rest of the shopping segment, there is something I want to touch on where, as a birthday present for Harry, uh, Hagrid buys him Hedwig the Owl, who is like a, you know, like Harry's mm -hmm. pet throughout all the books. And there's the mention of like, you're allowed one of three pets at Hogwarts, a toad, a cat, or an owl. And literally the only reason you would get either a toad or a cat it's kind of economic. Like, owls are sort of established here as being a lot more useful. They can do your post for you. Whereas a toad or a cat is just for the companionship. And that's something which I kind of, like, noticed throughout. Where, like, for example, with the list of things he has to buy for school. It's quite interesting that, like, a 12-year-old has to buy a reading list. You don't have to do that sort of thing in the UK until you're at least at college. And stuff like you have to buy your own uniform, you have to buy your own school equipment. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Harry has quite a bit of money left over from his parents. But it's, again, interesting that this orphan has to pay for it all out of pocket. And it is, like, it's very convenient he was left all this money. Because what would he be doing if he wasn't? 
And there is, this is not something we have to deal with because as part of, like, it, it would be a lot less fun if we went to the Wizarding World and we didn't have all the money in the world to spend. It is a thing that you, that you see at other points when you're introduced to other characters. The idea that, like, if you're someone who's poor and from a muggle family, and so you, you simply, like, you, if, if Harry did not have the means to pay for his own textbooks, because Vernon would not pay for them, uh, Hogwarts does have, like, a fund set up for students with that. Uh, but I don't mm. think you would get particularly nice ones as a result. Yeah, it's, like, reflective of, like, a weirdly mundane reality in this magical school where they just don't really provide the resources you need for you just out of their own pocket. Yeah, money is very real in Harry Potter from the get-go to wizards. Uh, Which is interesting. Yeah. We do have to remember, the, the person who was writing these books, or the person who wrote Philosopher's Stone, was not uh, a billionaire. She was a mm. single mother. I believe she, she was living on the dole while she was writing these and it was like a thing where like she wrote them in cafes because the cafes were heated and her the, the apartment she was living in didn't have great heating and so she would like take yeah. her her baby stroller there and things so it's i we have this idea of JK Rowling now as she's you know the billionaire uh she has more money than god and what does she know of the proles anymore and it's like perhaps like at this point she's now like detached on a cloud of privilege but when she wrote these, or when she wrote this, money was very real to her. And that's that. I think that may be part of why money is very real in this story. I think, yeah, it, it almost seems like part of the wish fulfillment is that Harry is loaded. Yes! <laughs> that, that kind of plays into it. There's a scene which we'll be discussing a little bit later, which again, I think, almost feels like part of the fantasy or part of the fun of it is what if you were fucking loaded yes. as a child. Yeah. Yeah, quickly, the last thing that happens in Diagon Alley is they go to see the wand maker, Ollivander. We get a little bit of introduction to, like, this guy's been around for a long time. He made both of Harry's parents' wands, Hagrid's wands, and even Voldemort's wand. Mm -hmm. And we get, like, an interesting little implication that even though Hagrid's wand was snapped upon his expulsion, he has sort of reforged it into the umbrella he carries around. And that is how he's still able to cast spells. Yes. Which I liked. I just found that interesting as, like, again, a bit of lore building. That, like, the magical property of a wand is almost transitive. Yeah, it's it's, it's a whole thing. Ollivander tests out a bunch of wands with Harry. He then measures his skull shape, gives him a wand from the same batch as the one Voldemort used to kill his parents, and then describes what Voldemort did as terrible but great. So I'm getting pretty bad vibes from this guy all round. <laughs> ah, uh, yeah, this guy. I, I the Ollivander scene is great to me. I, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll have cause to talk about it later. I that was always one of my favorite bits as a kid because it's the first time. Not, not exactly the first time because you were introduced to Voldemort earlier. But it's one of the, the first times when you really get a taste of kind of more of the darkness in magic or the spine tingling side of magic uh, when in Ollivander's when he's like, oh, and now and he's like excited about it that like I'm going to give you the wand that shares a core with the wand that killed your parents. And this is this is fun. Let's see where this goes. Uh, like that Bad is vibes. <laughs> Bad vibes. But this is the guy who... But, like, this is very... I don't know, like, I, I, I love it, though, as a story. In, in story... As a story thing, I love it. I would be terrified if this happened to me. But <laughs> as a story element, I love Ollivander's whole thing and his whole vibe. I love the terrible vibes of him as this extremely ominous guy who is the one who dispenses wands. And so you need him. He's a utility in the community. But... This this whole situation, like, uh, like you, you know, wizards can be creepy. Wizards can be spooky. Wizards can be, mm. you know, a bit have morality that does not jive with, you know, basic human decency. So yeah. Brief note that I also just find kind of funny is how like, I think as I remember correctly, like a big part of Harry Potter marketing and like merchandising is these like customizable ones you can get. 
Because there's a whole thing of like, there's all sorts of different cores you can have. You can mm-hmm. use all sorts of different types of wood. And the this... thing is, like, this is just something I find funny in that I don't think this was intended to be like merchandisable. Because personally, the idea of getting like a special piece of wood <laughs> is like kind of lame. <laughs> yeah, this is something like. Merchant, like, if you were to do this, like, th- this was written to be a book, not to be a franchise, mm. as it is written right now. And, you know, the wand on paper is a very cool thing. The wand as an object that you can see is not a very cool thing. The wand, the, the, yeah. the, the, it's, it's a stick. It's a wooden stick, and that's it. It's a tool. Yeah, it doesn't look very interesting. But it, when they describe it in here and you get like there's different woods and different cores and different lengths and different characters to the way that they are, the way he describes them. It's all very like, ooh, like what what's my personality quiz wand like? And that's also that's part of the appeal. And I know that she as part of her like alchemy nerd stuff about this, the wand lore runs pretty deep and pretty authentic actually surprisingly mm. like you know, like this whole thing is a fantasy kitchen sink like stuff is coming from everywhere but like this is but this is one of the few things that Paramore is actually good for where you can look up uh, like the different what different wand woods mean and there is a kind of like some of it's just kind of her talking out of her ass but some of it are just kind of like her making stuff up for a fantasy world but a lot of it is kind of drawn from real like stuff like wood lore and real wand lore that has existed. Um, and like there's stuff like the, the specific wood for different characters has some kind has a significance to it. Um, and so like, there's a, like this is the wands are one of the deeper aspects of Harry Potter lore. If you really want to get into it, but it, they are also again, like what you were saying exactly like at first, this is not the most merchandisable object. It's just a wooden stick when you look at it. And if you were going to make a franchise out of these very personalized things, you'd want them to all be different or you want them to be more like not just the stick that you're waving around, like like have have like a jewel or have like a glowy yeah. thing or have, I don't know, make it a tiara. I don't know. Just... <laughs> That's, um, because, like, almost the way I sort of read Ollivander and the way he talks about wands is, like, he's like an anorak. It's just, like, he would talk about this the same way if he was really into his fishing rods. Yes. his fucking model railway. Yeah. Uh, and the wands, the wands do end up, like, the whole thing about the, him sharing the same core with Voldemort. Uh, that's gonna, that's gonna be a whole thing, um, as you can probably imagine. Um, and the, the lore around whose wand is whose and like that, the whole situation with the wands ends up going and that, that has ends up having pretty big ramifications down the line. And it's kind of a misstep of the series that the wands aren't more a uh, thingy than they are. Like that, like they are, it is just a wooden stick and it is not very visually evocative, uh, mm. as much as it could be. And a lot of the wand, a lot of the lore aspect is stuff that just kind of is in, like, it's not, it's not quite, it's like the, like what cherry wood means or what hazel would mean. Like, this is not stuff that's given to the reader at all. And that is, I don't know, I kind of wish, like, if you were going to make the wand such an important thing, the like, give them more as, uh, give them more presence and give, like, explain them a bit more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So that kind of does it for this chapter of Diagon Alley. We now cut back to our main character of Dudley, <laughs> who is piss scared of Harry at this point, terrified of him. Harry's back home for only a little while until he is due to go to King's Cross and get the Hogwarts Express. Um, we get like a we get a bit of like interesting characterization from Virgin where he's like no longer furious at Harry, he just seems disinterested with him. We also get, like, a little line about how fucking Dudley has to get the tail removed. (laughs) (laughs) Apparently that doesn't just wear off on its own. No. Uh, But yeah, Vernon drives Harry down to London with all his shit, 
drops him off, and then assuming that because there is no actual nine in free court in this platform, drives off to ditch him, presuming that he'll, I don't know, die of exposure. <laughs> I... Uh, Harry, yeah, he can't find the platform, but he hangs around for a minute and overhears people talking about muggles. So, like, presuming they're a wizard family, they are. They're the Weasleys, we all know and love. Yes. Uh, he watches them and asks... I don't actually know if we've given her name yet, so I'm just going to say Mama Weasley. Like, how exactly do you get on the train? And she's, like, uh, very polite to him, very kind, shows him how to get on, and immediately, like, draws a line of, like, oh, it's your first year? It's my Ron's first year, too. Yes, here, make friends with my son. He needs them. Classic mum shit. Yes. We get onto the platform, which is, again, like, yeah, liminal space, place between places, very cool. And we're introduced to a few characters at once here. Offhandedly, Neville, um, who has lost his toad, as he is wont to do. Yes. Uh, as well as the Weasley family, there's Percy, Fred and George, and Ron. Um, Percy's a prefect, we already kind of get like a little bit of him being kind of a... Uh, He's not, like, super toady, but he is, like, a bit of a teacher's pet. Yes. Hence him being a prefect. <laughs> Meanwhile, Fred and George are, like, little rascals, you know? Proper fucking horrible Henry, Dennis the Menace types. Mm-hmm. And Ron, who... He, he's the sort of kid who, yeah, perpetually has some shit on his nose, like a black stain that he just can't get off. He's just this kind of awkward, uh, awkward child. Yeah, awkward. Like, the, the Weasley family is a family entirely of middle children, except, like, for the oldest and youngest. But Ron is the middlest child of them all. Yeah, he even gets, like, a fair bit of shtick from his uh, brother's friend George. Like, they clearly prefer teasing him over his little sister, who I forgot to mention, Ginny. I yes. think she comes up later. I yeah, she's she, important. she becomes more of a character later. Uh, a controversial character. One of the most Ooh. controversial of the series. Um, but, yeah, G Ginny at this point is just, like, the cute younger sibling. Yeah. Uh, we get, like, a little bit of, like, Miss w Harry watching Miss Weasley talk to her kids. Uh, and she, again, sort of stresses that she would like them to make friends with Harry Potter if they can. And to try not to, like, you know, harp on what happened with Voldemort sort of thing. Which again yeah. is like, I think it's pretty clear they're setting her up to be kind of like the mum that Harry didn't have. Kind of like a friend's mum who takes her under her wing. Yeah, that's... It's great you're you're getting that. we Like, five minutes, five seconds of meeting her. And you already see that's what she is. And that's exactly what she is going to be. Yeah. There's a lot of shorthand with her. Like, the minute it described her as plump, I'm like, oh, she's a nice, like, homely mother figure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, see? Fat people can be nice. <laughs> occasionally <laughs> Fred and George come onto the train to meet Harry and again they sort of like and here's our brother Ron please be his friend <laughs> and uh, Ron and Harry have their famous scene at the first meeting Yeah, which I think is kind of fun in the books because Ron just immediately dumps his middle child syndrome at Harry's feet he, like, does. he just goes on a whole thing yeah, like, I mean, it takes, I think Harry does have to, like, prod him a little, like, there, there is, like, they, they, they have, like, awkward, almost first date energy, where <laughs> both of them are, like, like, this is the most fascinating person I've, like, I, like, Harry has met nothing but fascinating people since he's entered the wizarding world, but, you know, Ron is also equally fascinating to everything else that's going on, and Ron is like, it's Harry Potter, that's fascinating, but, you know, they, they're both kind of like, eh, I, like they're awkward and shy about it. It's it's very cute. Um, yeah. But yeah, after a bit of prodding about Ron's life, Ron just kind of word vomits his issues. At Harry's There's face. a running theme with a lot of the kids in this chapter, from Malfoy to Ron to Hermione, who appears in a little bit. Contrast to Harry, they will just talk and talk and talk. Yes. Yeah. It's actually something which I actually I. <sighs> I would dislike it if it was a constant thing, but I think, like, it's definitely something that children actually do. Yeah. And I like it, in contrast to Harry, it kind of shows you how these people had healthier childhoods than he did. 
Because, mm. like, talking a lot and talking about your feelings and thoughts and your issues with things and parroting your parents, that's a very normal kid thing to do. Being yeah. afraid and riddled with insecurity and not talking at all because you're afraid of looking stupid, that is, that's a symptom of because he grew up in this household where it was not okay to ask questions or to talk ever. And, like, you know, he's, yeah, he, he's, he's very careful with his words. Because he yeah. grew up in this very abusive household. And also, like, there's this section where Harry uh, realizes the tuck shop, like, is coming along. And he buys just an absolute fuckload of sweets for him and Ron to share instead of having Ron's crappy sandwiches. Okay, a note on Ron's sandwiches, because this always annoyed me, because I like corned beef. I would take <laughs> corned beef over all of their candy any day. Because I just, my, my favorite sandwich is a Reuben. That sounds, even if it's cold, I will take it. I like it. Uh, and I'm not really a chocolate person. So that's just me, though. Like, I know it, it means something for them. I understand that. But Yeah, I mean, a pumpkin pasty does sound nice and wizardly, but it also sounds fucking disgusting. <laughs> ah, I can kind of see. Yeah. It's like a pumpkin spice latte as a pasty. I don't know. But yeah, there's an interesting thing again of like, we get a bit more of Harry in the A, he's kind of doing something which I think kids are want to do, where like, they'll, if they want to make friends, they'll start by just trying to give them shit. Yes. And also like, I think he takes a certain joy in being able to do this. He's like, for the first time in his life, he can be the generous one. And again, I think it's that fantasy, which almost part of it is just, what if you had money? Yeah. It is a great fantasy. What if you had money and you could share it with your friends? Like mm -hmm. that is, and it is like a great feeling too. Like I, like I'm not a person who has a ton of money, but I've always like, I don't know, like when I'm on dates, I always want to pay for things, even if I don't really have the money to do so, just because I like doing that. And it is a very, you know, it's, yeah. And this is, this is part of why I was getting, I was becoming very endeared to Harry during these chapters anyway because like i think i said before his character was kind of on the margins of dudley's world before but now like that whole like he the whole bit where he is so happy to share things with someone that is like it's every manish in the sense that you can kind of relate to it but it is also very specific because that's something that i think a lot of people maybe would take for granted or not think about but to him like this is like the I don't know, this is part of the joy of it to him. Hmm. Uh, they share some of the sweets together, and we get, like, a mention of another, like, very, very well-known merchandisable thing of, like, was it Bertie Bonicle's Every Flavor Bean? Bertie Bot's Every Flavor Beans. That's the one. It's the one which they actually made in real life. Um, yeah. Which is interesting how that was, like, a magical thing, but honestly, like... <laughs> Jelly bean technology has always been kind of insane in how close you <laughs> can get the flavors to like the real thing. Well, I think it, the only novel thing was the idea of putting nasty shit in there too. Yeah, well, like also with the real version of them, I know that they don't. They could make stuff that tastes like boogers, but they don't because that would be gross. And so they make stuff that tastes like an acceptable idea of boogers, not yeah. really what boogers are. I think that the wizard shit is hardcore. And it will give you, like, you know, actual horrible things. Literally. Um, you literally get a jelly bean that tastes like wizard shit. Yes. <laughs> yes. Horrible. Yeah, this is what I, like, there's, for merchandising, because we talk about the wands. The wands are a merchandising misstep. The houses are a merchandising genius that is not fully utilized in the storytelling of the series. And the, the, the candy is i think an example a, of merchandising genius where like this is like you you made candy this is this is this is part of why harry potter is crack for children because there's candy <laughs> in universe that you can buy like it's 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 yeah. great uh and my f the birdie bots is that we what stood out always stood out to me or what stood out to me this reading is the chocolate frog cards that's a brilliant concept yeah i was about to say like this is the sort of thing where I think if I'd read these as a kid, I would have latched on to is like the baseball cards, but for wizards is very fun. Yeah. And it is 
like it's 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 genius on the level of it's a thing that children would want to have like you can sell that this is merch but it's also genius in story as a world building element because it ties in the wizarding world to history and mythology in a way that's cool like mm. who 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 is on the frog cards and it's a mix Ptolemy? of yeah Ptolemy's on the frog cards Agrippa Circe Figures from mythology, figures from alchemic history, and names that Rowling just made up are all kind of mixed together in the frog cards. <gasps> Cersei Lannister? <laughs> but yeah, um, it is also worth noting that on Dumbledore's card, the trivia they give includes he is well known for his defeat of Dark Wizard Grindelwald in 1945. This is now- inf- information that i hope is never expanded on <laughs> <laughs> now i have not seen fantastic beasts um i didn't really know it was set during world war ii and i have a bad feeling about the defeat in 1945 part that the the, the bad feeling about that is well founded and okay it wasn't as bad in the original series the new movies though have got like you, you, however bad you're thinking that could go as a concept that is exactly where it is going um, oh god yeah that is exactly where it is going and I don't we're not going to talk too much about that because I, I think it's just worth saying just sort of here and now I think the idea of making an entire movie set in World War 2 based on a throwaway line on a baseball card in a children's book was not a good move. Now, to be fair, the Dumbledore and Grindelwald, in later books, that backstory is expanded on. I, I don't know how much of that was planned or conceived at this point in the series. I assume most none of it. Like, n- m- most... I Yeah, like, I think for- 1945 was done very deliberately as a date. Um, but... I, if I were to guess, I would say that this is about what it appears to be, as it appears right now, which is that Dumbledore is a super famous wizard, and he was involved in something big and important, and that's part of why he's super famous, and... He was there on D-Day. Right, yeah, that's basically all this to say. Like, he was involved in World War II wizards, and that's kind of all you need to really understand about it. Um yeah. Uh, so we should flag this up as, like, this is the moment where we first meet Hermione. Yay! Or, I don't like, what, what do you think of Hermione when you first meet her? <laughs> uh, she's really annoying. I like her. Yeah. Yeah, she is. I always, I never quite liked her as a kid because I saw too much of myself in her. Like, I was like, <laughs> I'm in this picture and I don't like it about Hermione. Um, I think this is maybe something that changes, like, when you read these as an adult versus a kid. Is in some ways, like, as a kid, I would find her annoying. As an adult, I find her kind of cute of, like, oh, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, it was always something, like, Hermione always rubbed me the wrong way because I was definitely very much like Hermione as a kid. But I always, in my head, I was aware that that is kind of how I might be perceived. And so I sort of self consciously tried to. I don't know, like, like, it's a thing that I've worked over the course of my life trying to, like, finding these strategies to be, like, I'm the smart person, I am I know all the things, I did the homework, like, I'm that person, but you have to put this layer of cool affectation and wittiness on top of it <laughs> in order to be acceptable, and when anyone sees your earnestness, when that comes to, through too clearly, that's a misstep. And so Hermione, to me, is cringe. Or she always came across as very cringe to me when I was a child. And that's why I was always kind of like, mm, like I, she rubbed me the wrong way. But that, that, that was just my own hangups. That, that's almost what I find kind of endearing about her. It's like, we were introduced to her doing something quite kind. She's helping Neville find his frog just out of the kindness of her heart. But also she's like, yeah, very socially unaware. She doesn't pick up on the fact that immediately Ron thinks she's annoying. Yes, yeah. Or, like, that Harry kind of, not so much, but is definitely, like, not not really listening to her when she talks to him. Yeah. Well, it is very, like, she's like, 
oh, like her way of introducing herself to him to try to find common ground is to say, oh, I've read about you in all of these books. And he's like, great. <laughs> <laughs> and also, like, she she is mentioned to be talking to Percy. And again, it's like she's trying to talk to the big kids. She's trying to mm-hmm. be, like, up there and, like, really flex what she knows intellectually. I think it's like, again, it's just this very convincing, kind of cringe person. Yeah. Um, she sort of breezes through this scene, though. We don't get a huge amount of time with her. Uh, we get a little bit more backstory on Ron's family, and he mentions that his older brother, Bill, who is now graduated, is in Africa doing something for Gringotts. Mm-hmm. So... I guess he is in Elon Musk's dad's emerald mine, then, I guess. <laughs> uh, you actually learn what that is uh, in the second one, and it is not... It's, it's not as bad as that sounds when you first hear it, actually. <laughs> if, if you're thinking, these are emerald mines in Africa? What? No, it's uh, what he's doing. Do, do you want me to say what he's doing, or do you want to find out? No, I think imagining him in the apartheid emerald mine. Is <laughs> okay, fair enough. Though, 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 I think that is that with the with my goblins headcanon fairy lore that I delivered a little bit ago. This helps a bit with that because he's a wizard and he's working for Gringotts. Gringotts is not an entirely goblin run operation, uh, mm. in my interpretation. Mm. So, like Hagrid said, the banks are run by goblins. Ron says, oh yeah, my brother is working for Gringotts. So I think that you can interpret as that like, okay, wizard, like sort of like what I was saying, where it's a jointly done thing. Gringotts as a bank is a wizard institution and the goblins are there to oversee the exchange of gold, but they're not the ones controlling wizard to wizard transactions. Yeah. Uh, Then the rest of the chapter, we get a brief confrontation with Malfoy when he comes to see like what Potter's up to. Uh, this time, like, he has two, like, big, burly fat lads with him. Mm-hmm. Who, again, you know, fat boys and mean boys, I get it. But what's interesting is we get, like, this is kind of a good Harry moment in that, again, Malfoy, like, puts his foot in his mouth by insulting Ron. Yes. Um, and Harry, like, has this moment where he's uh, too brave for, his, for himself to be able to back up. Like, he starts really talking shit, and he knows he shouldn't be. Which I think is something that did sort of come through in the Dursley chapters of like, yeah, Harry has this streak of bravery to the point of endangering himself. Yeah. Yeah, he... It's it's his little way of defiance in the face of, like, the life he's had is his kind of, like, being... Bra- like, you know, you're going to get punished anyway, so I'm going to be a smartass and have a spine uh, regardless. Yeah, it's interesting how it's played off as, like, it's not really a smart thing to do. He should probably just keep his mouth shut, but he can't help himself. Yeah. Uh, it is, like, ha- Harry's ability to understand that Malfoy is a shit is not, like, impressive, but it's good. It's good. He, the, the, this, the kid's gonna be alright. He's perceptive, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, like, c- Crisis averted. Ron's pet rat Scabbers bites the finger of one of the two like Malfoy's bodyguards and scares a lot of them off. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hermione passes back through again to say that she came to hang out in here because everyone's being very immature. And all I've got written here is just Hermione's such a melt. Love her. <laughs> that was that was that was something I related to of like. Being the kid who was maybe a bit too concerned about other kids misbehaving. Mm, yeah, I can remember being that a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thankfully was never a snitch, but I remember, like, I would get maybe a bit too bothered about other kids, like, messing around, and I should have. Yeah, like, it's, let, let people mess around, it's just fun. They sort of play up the fact that she's quite bossy already, and again, I guess that's part of it, of, like, she tends to fuss about what other people are doing a lot. Mm-hmm. I suppose, I don't know if now, since we're talking about Hermione, would be the time to mention that it is, it, it is a known thing that Hermione was, like, like all of the characters are kind of, like, when you, when you write things, characters come from you, and, 
like Harry obviously like shares quite a bit with JK Rowling in some respects, but Hermione specifically is inspired by Rowling's uh like how she felt about herself uh as a little kid, like being sort of the know-it-all girl um who people don't really like very much. Um that's where that's where Hermione comes from. Uh a good deal. Yeah, there's definitely like there's a very personal and like such a, such a like full idea of who this person is that I find it pretty easy to imagine it's like speaking from real experience. Yeah, yeah, and Hermione Hermione's one of the characters who has like people really uh latch on to when they latch on to her. Hmm. And in the last little bit of this chapter, we just get uh, Hagrid leading these like self-propelled boats from the train station at Hogwarts to the actual front door. And don't panic, everyone. Neville finds his frog. Yay! Uh, no, a note on toads, I suppose, because we brought this up earlier that toads are useless. And there's nothing to contradict that, really, in these books. But... Since then, like on Pottermore, the lore has tried to be a bit expanded. Like, no, toads are useful, sort of. Uh, toads and cats can be, I forget how cats can be useful, but toads you can use in potions and things to like test things out on. Uh, there, it's oh, like, I, if, thought you meant, <laughs> I thought you meant you could just like put them in the potion as an ingredient. <laughs> no, it's like, you, you can, like, well, it's like, I think you, you can like use toads to feed potions, like, they're fairly durable. And so right. you can test stuff. It's like you. It's like having a guinea pig uh, that okay. you can. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so they're useful for animal testing. Sick. Basically, yes. Yeah, I forget what cats are good for. I think cats are good because cats are fun. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I would be tempted to keep a toad because I like toads, but yeah. that's just me. <laughs> Uh, last chapter, and just being a bit wary of time, we'll try and blast through this a bit. Oh goodness, where are we? The oh god, we have hat. been, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the sorting hat. Uh, we are introduced to, like, each of the houses by McGonagall, who also, between her and Dumbledore, they basically lay out, like, some of the school traditions, including the House Cup, which is this tournament where, over the course of the year, the house that gains the most points through individual actions... I think just has a feast for in front of them or something. Don't really elaborate on what they win. Respect. Um, respect, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the four houses have their own noble history, except maybe Slytherin, but you know. <laughs> except Slytherin, who are elitist shits. Uh. We're introduced to the Hogwarts ghost, sort of midway through McGonagall's speech. They all fly in, having their own conversation. Uh, I like how they almost seem like, like, yeah, they are the ghosts of the school, but they only really seem to have a cursory interest in what goes on here. Mm. They've got their own lives going on. On lives, but yeah. We also, like, there's a brief bit which I wanted to touch on of, like, they mentioned that the fucking roof of the Great Banquet Hall, where they actually have the sorting ceremony, is just almost, it, it seems as though it's opened up to the night sky. And I don't remember that from the films. I feel like that was almost, like, a bit of a missed opportunity. Yeah, I feel, I think if they did it, it was a weird effect. I, I, I don't know, yeah, I don't know if they actually did that. But yeah, that that's the thing that it the great the, the ceiling of the great hall looks like it looks like the sky. That's just something I want to note, like or like put a pin in as sort of someone who's only ever seen one movie of the first film, uh, bleh, the first film years ago. Of like, there is quite already quite a few details that don't necessarily match up perfectly. I yeah, just found it interesting. Yeah, already you can see how why there are book and movie people. Hmm. Uh, we introduce the Sorting Hat, which gives us a wonderful bit of spoken word poetry uh, discussing <laughs> the virtues of each house. Um, everyone claps. I I can't believe everyone is just completely silent while a hat <laughs> reads a poem, but whatever. Oh, it's not. It's a song. The hat is singing. Oh, it's singing. It oh is singing. No, no, no. This is a singing hat. Uh... Okay, it's a singing hat as well as a talking hat. Yes. He, the way the sorting ceremony works is just you put the hat 
onto the child, and the hat will have a think about it for a bit and declare what house they're in. Yes. So that's Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, or Slytherin. Uh, heroic, dumb, smart, evil. <laughs> that's what we know so far. Yeah. Uh, they move through like the sorting ceremony, and we get all of our main characters uh, sort of tend to fall into Gryffindor. We find out Malfoy got Slytherin. in. Everyone's kind of where you'd expect them to be. But we do get a bit of an interesting bit when Harry's turn comes up. Because they put the hat on his head, and it has a good long think, and it seems to want to put him in Slytherin. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't know if you had a comment on that, or... Oh, I, I mean, this is something that people have thought about, have spent a lot of time thinking about why people go where, and Harry is put in not Slytherin because he says not Slytherin. Uh, he, the, the hat is, the hat is like, oh, are you sure you don't want to go in Slytherin? You, 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 you could do well in Slytherin. And Harry's like, not Slytherin. And so he's like, okay, Gryffindor then. That makes more sense for you. And there's a lot of, I, I think, okay, this is where we get Carol, uh, Reba, Reba headcanon fairy, where my interpretation of the hat kind of cuts the Gordian knot of a lot of the way people have the discussions about it. Like a lot of people will talk about, well, why is Hermione in Gryffindor? Clearly she's Ravenclaw because she's got this whole needing to be smart thing. And... Or, you know, she, she's so smart, she's so intelligent, aren't those Ravenclaw traits? That's what the hat said. But listen to what Hermione told you. She said that Gryffindor is the house she wanted. She said, like, she tells you that Gryffindor sounds like the best one, and that's the one she wants to be in, I think because Dumbledore was in it. Um, and the hat listens to your choice. And not everyone makes a choice that way, but... I think that has a lot more to do with why the hat puts you where than what traits yeah. you actually possess. Uh, it's almost like the traits thing is like the fallback if you don't have a house in mind. That's what, Yeah, that's one way to think about it. The way I think about it is that the hat puts you not where... Not what with what traits you have, but with the values that you <laughs> aspire to, if that makes sense. So uh, homestuck. Hmm? So, like, Homestuck. I suppose... I Depends on what aspect of Homestuck. But I think, yeah, it's much more <laughs> self-deterministic than you would yeah. think it is. Or to some degree, because a lot of this is a nurture thing. Like, Draco has the traits of Slytherin House, but also he wants to be in Slytherin. And the reason he wants to be in Slytherin is because all of his family have been in Slytherin. And so when he comes up to the hat, in his mind, he's thinking, put me in Slytherin. And so the hat barely touches him, and it's like, this kid's a Slytherin! Um, Hmm. And with Ron, Ron doesn't have a whole lot going on in his life. He's very insecure. He's, you know, he's an awkward kid. I wouldn't call him especially brave or noble or any of that. But all of his family have been in Gryffindor. He understands the Gryffindor values as the ones he aspires to. And so that's where the hat puts him. Um... And so, like, in Hermione's case, she is very intelligent, she is very smart, she has, like, these very Ravenclaw traits, but she aspires to Gryffindor ones. Those are the ones that she considers to be good. And so that's where she goes. And, you know, we don't get to see, like, Hufflepuffs do have their own tradition, and there are people who would say, put me in Hufflepuff. And you do meet in the series later. Yeah, like you! Like, you do meet in the series later, kid who are in Hufflepuff, where it's like, why are they here? This guy's kind of a shit. And it's like, well, maybe he's in Hufflepuff because he asks to be there. Because even if he doesn't possess Hufflepuff traits, for whatever reason, he sees Hufflepuff as the place, like, like if he was the best version of himself, that's where he would be. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so Harry doesn't request a specific house, but he does say not Slytherin. And that tells you something about what traits he values and what traits he does not. He, he looks at Slytherin and sees, like, you know, the shittiness, the elitism, the racism, like, all that stuff, and he doesn't want a part of it. And that tells you, like, sort of on the flip side, the traits that he values are the noble Gryffindor ones. And so that's where he goes. Um, yeah. With Neville, this is a... This, okay, this is... But so, like, with Neville, this is a, something they don't dwell on, but it took... The hat took a while with Neville. 
And that's because in Neville's own mind, Neville was requesting Hufflepuff. And, but the hat understood that Neville saying put me in Hufflepuff was not because he values, he agrees with the Hufflepuff values or thinks that Hufflepuff is great and I should be there. He's saying that to be self-deprecating. He doesn't think that he's good enough to be Gryffindor. And so he's saying put me in Hufflepuff. And the hat, yeah. after arguing with him about it for a while, puts him in the place where he is, where he really aspires to be. Um, yeah. But yeah. And so that's, 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 that, that is Reba's, uh, headcan fairy for the story head. And now you never need to argue about it again. I say, <laughs> as everyone continues to argue about it, like, no, but Hermione should have been Ravenclaw. No, that's not how this works. Clearly this is, that is not how this works. No one. Was yeah. Listening. The reason I sort of like almost like prompted you with that one was I thought, yeah, there's no way Reba doesn't have some takes about this. <laughs> I, I there's one other person I've encountered with these same opinions, and that's Quinn Curio, and they've done some video essays that are quite good. Oh. I I had the I had these opinions I've had these opinions for a while, um, and they're the only other person I've seen have the same take. And I went to like their Discord. And there, like, even there, everyone who's like, oh, yeah, that's reasonable. And then they proceed to continue to argue about the how the Hogwarts houses and how they're placed. Like, even knowing that, I'm like, no, this is, this is a solution to all of these arguments. You never need to do this again. And you also don't really need to take the Hogwarts quizzes. Because if you have a place you want to be, that is where you will go. Like, ugh. So what you're saying is, in my sort of, like, uh, ignorant just assertion that I am a Hufflepuff and I will be there... I'm actually more correct than any of these people who've read all the books. Yes. Yes, you oh, are. Feels good. <laughs> feels good. And I am Ravenclaw because so I, I have two impulses deep in my soul. My first impulse is I need to be smarter than everyone else. I need to be like clever and interesting. My other impulse is that I need I want to be more special than everyone else. I want to be unique. And mm. that is wanting to be special is a very Slytherin uh, impulse. And wanting to be smart is a very Ravenclaw aspiring to that. And so, like when I took the when I took the official quiz, I got Ravenclaw twice and Slytherin once. And so I'm like I'm, I'm like a Neville situation where it sits on my head for a bit, and then it's like Ravenclaw. Uh, yeah, that, yeah. No, the hat sees me walking up and just screams Hufflepuff. <laughs> yes. But yeah, um, we then get like a little bit of like. Uh, feels like sort of foreshadowing with the teachers when they appear. There's a pretty conspicuous line mentioning that Professor Quirrell has reappeared, now wearing a purple turban, which yes. Harry kind of like finds a bit odd. Uh, he doesn't have the language for it at the time, but what he's experiencing is cultural appropriation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, uh, yeah. It's... Modern version of Harry Potter where Quirrell has white person dreadlocks. Yes. Yeah, and like a giant Rasta hat. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> Professor Quirrell. <laughs> like Hober in that one episode of Simpsons, that fucking huge Rasta hat. Yes, exactly. That is what we are looking at with Professor Quirrell. Uh, uh, Dumbledore comes up to give a speech where he says he'll give a few words. And he says, like, nitwit, uh, nitwit wobbly boo. Nit nitwit blubber oddment tweak. Very random of you, uh, Dumbledore. Uh, <laughs> glad to see you're keeping 2003 humor alive. We love to see it. <laughs> and we also get, like, uh, Snape. Professor Snape. We meet him for the first time. And as he looks over to Harry, his forehead starts burning. Mm. Not literally, but, like, painfully. Yeah. And that's immediately, like, supposed to be a bit of foreshadowing. This Snape fella? Bad news. Yes. It's a, it's uh, a very, like, as foreshadowing goes, it's a bit, like, anvil. For, foreshadowing via anvil to the forehead. Like, oh, my... Like, yeah. <laughs> bad, my bad person here alarm went off when he looked at me. Oh, I saw an ugly man and my scar hurts. Oh. <laughs> I saw an incel and my scar hurt. <laughs> Never let Harry on Reddit. He'll just be in agony. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> we also get introduced to the fact that, like, uh, each house has kind of an assigned ghost. 
Oh, just, yeah, sure. You got your, your house crest, your house name, your house values, and the house ghost. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gryffindor's is nearly headless Nick. So called because his neck is almost completely decapitated, but still kind of holds on by a thread. Yes. In uh, afterlife. I have a note on him, and my note is that decapitation is not a very wizard way to kill someone. So you can infer, and then this is confirmed later, but you, you can infer that he was not killed by wizards. Uh, Mm-hmm. As they were trying, like, trying to decapitate him. And there is, in in the lore of Harry Potter, I, I, I've already discussed this uh, in the last episode, where, like, with the, the witch trials were harmless to the witches and wizards. They didn't actually feel any pain when you tried to burn them or kill them. But we do find out that actually, that so, somehow, nearly headless Nick was killed by witch hunting modal. Ooh. So I kind of wonder how accurate those histories are, or how, like, if it if it's such a blanket truth that the Muggles weren't ever to do any da- ever able to do any damage to wizards, because at yeah. least in one case you have a very uh, very graphic visual of at least one instance where uh, they were. We also have to do, we do have to again give uh, Matt's geeky history corner. We have to give marks for the fact that it was very common in medieval executions uh, for things to get like botched or not done properly, especially with the headings. Mm. Yeah, I sh- it, was, it was actually a thing where if you were a person of noble status, you would request like a particular skilled swordsman to behead you. Because if you just got any old punter, it could take a few hacks. Oh god, yeah. <laughs> I think this is like medieval, rowling medieval history nerd to Matt medieval history nerd. This is handshake joke <laughs> happening there. <laughs> yeah. So that was um. That's the sort of grisly shit I'm about. I used to read horrible histories as a kid, and I'd like point at that and go, yeah. Yeah, that's nearly headless. Nearly headless Nick is yeah. We also get introduced to Slytherin's ghost, the Bloody Baron, and I can't believe they even have a fucking evil ghost. <laughs> I mean, he hasn't done anything evil. He's just sitting there being covered in blood. It's he's maybe he's lovely. Man. Maybe he has a. He's a scary man covered in blood called the Bloody Baron. <laughs> You think you think he's actually the Red Baron? <laughs> that never stop being on brand, Slytherin. Yeah, we we sort of go back to the dorms after the end of the feast, where the, the, this is something actually. Before I move on, the feast is described as like having like all these wonderful foods coming out, but all they're describing is just shit you would have at a roast dinner. I was like kind of expecting it to keep going with like curries and like steamed rice and pizza and it's like no you'll have your stodgy food and you'll like it <laughs> oh, that's funny i mean yeah it is not very ethnically diverse it's very <laughs> like traditional english feast for medieval english people it- yeah it's like this isn't actually that much of a feast. I could go to a pub carvery and get this for like ten pound. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the Patel twins have opinions about the feastiness of this feast. <laughs> but yeah, um, after the dog shit feast, we go back to <laughs> the dorm rooms. Uh, we find out sort of a little bit about like Hogwarts is a little bit of a mysterious, dangerous place. Dumbledore mentions that like you need. Don't go into the Forbidden Forest. There's a particular corridor you can't go into on pain of death. And also there's just poltergeists who'll throw shit at you. Yeah, it's it's great. It's really cool. <laughs> so we kind of already established this place as a PvP area. Yeah. Need to watch your back. Uh, everyone settles down for bed, and Harry has a dream where a man with white person dreadlock speaks to him. <laughs> And tries to encourage him to embrace who he is and become a Slytherin. Um, it's kind of interesting that 
compared to like what I thought would be going on, Voldemort here is kind of like a Darth Vadery join me on the dark side angle. Yes. It it definitely has that angle to it. Well I feel like we should save that conversation for later when it's more a thing. But yeah, it's, yeah you're, you're yeah, picking yeah. up on that right now that there's a join me on the dark side thing. And yeah, I think J.K. Rowling may have seen Star Wars at some point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's sort of everything that happens in these three chapters, just blasting through uh, the plot of them. Reba, we have a segment on this show where we ask ourselves some questions, don't we? Yes, we are, we have homework at the end of every episode. Uh, these are the, the extracurricular activities. These are three questions. The first question is, who is the chosen one? Which is, who is your favorite character of the week? Harry Potter is famous for its loads and loads, thousands and thousands of characters, each more quirky and fascinating than the last. So for this week, who is, your, who is the chosen one? I think Hagrid had a strong showing this week, for one. Uh, I liked meeting with Ron. But I think my chosen one this week might be Hermione. Okay, talk. Okay, you've already talked a bit about here. Is there anything more you want to say with, with Hermione? Uh, there's just like a little bit more of her, which I didn't touch on, of like she's just talking throughout the Great Hall scene, so as to no one in particular. <laughs> Like, she is this constant font of little factoids and things, which is, it, I would say it's it's very convenient writing, but it's also mm. very realistic, because I know that was me, always, and now. <laughs> I guess what I have to sum up why I like her is that, like, I've had an interest in teaching for a while, and Hermione seems like the best student possible. Aww, that's, a, that's like, a, that's a lovely thing to say uh, about that character. Um, yeah. Who would your chosen one be, Reba? My chosen one this week is actually Harry himself. And mm. I know that's that's da like uh dark horse choice, dark horse candidate. But I think <laughs> I've talked a bit about why, which is he like you you get more of his character, and I like the character that's there. He has this very clear motivation. It's not it's not fully explicitly stated yet. We're gonna get a bit more of it later, but he has this very, it's its very relatable, but also very acute sense of wanting to be part of, he wants to be long. He wants to be part of a community and be part of a group of people who accept him. And you can see, like, all of his insecurities, all of his, you know, the way he interacts with basically every character, you can kind of see that engine motivating it. Like, the, his interaction with Malfoy in particular is very telling because even like within that Harry understands oh this kid's kind of a shit he's reminding me a lot of Dudley but even yeah. with that like at the end of it Malfoy still manages to make Harry feel terrible and it kind of puts a pall over his mood for like a mm. good chunk of the day because Malfoy made him feel like maybe he doesn't belong here because Malfoy yeah. was talking about how, like, you know, some wizards don't, some people don't even know about Hogwarts before they hear, before they get their letter, like, what trash they are. And Harry, that made him feel like garbage. And he's very susceptible to feeling like, maybe I don't actually belong here. And the idea that he could belong someplace is almost too good to be true to him. Because it's such, like, he's been so starved of that. And mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's sort of like, I don't know, it, it's very, uh, I, don't know, I I respect him a lot more as a character than I think I have in past go readings of this. Maybe it's because like at this point I've written a bit more, and so I've had to come up with characters on my own and figure out what motivates them and how they they run. And Harry, Harry does run. He's not just you know a Lego brick. He he does have like something going on. And I I enjoyed him when he got to be more of his own character. Like in his interactions with Ron, I like that scene a lot. But I found that mm. I kind of more than liking Ron, I like the character Harry be was a Harry became in that scene where like he tries to cheer Ron up. He try he shares his food with Ron. He's you know, like he stands up for him, even though he's this person he just met because he's like, ah, I finally have a friend, and now I will be a good <laughs> friend to him. Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I think 
also like Harry kind of becomes more interesting in this chapter in contrast to the kids around him, like we were discussing earlier. Yeah. Yeah, and the the bit where the hat points out that he has this thirst to prove himself. That is like yeah, that that is I guess you could say like what would make him a good Slytherin even? I think that kind of that thirst to like I want to prove that I am something ness to him. Uh and his sort of his insecurities around that Slytherin because it is the elitist house. It also is like the house where like everybody has insecurities. Nobody has more insecurities than Slytherin. Mm. And I think that's kind of part of why there is like there, there is like a little bit of potential darkness to the character in those kinds of incidents. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, yes. That's favorite. That's chosen one of the week. Now, no, uh, question number two is what is the magical moment of the week? Uh, and we had a lot of magic to pick over here. Mm. Almost too much. I don't know how you chose anything. It took me a lot to choose something. So the magical <laughs> moments is something magical that you found inviting or evocative or terrifying. It's just something, an element of the, of magic that stood out to you. I think this is maybe a little bit of a boring answer, but I kind of touched on how I just, there's something I find inherently kind of magical and interesting about how everything exists between spaces. Mm, that's a really good, that's actually, I think, a very good choice. Uh, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, without going over a lot of what we've already said there's just something to the idea of like the magical world is both literally and figuratively where you don't think to look between everyday items between the mundane exists like it's right there it's not hiding you just don't think to look for it and i just find that really engaging personally yeah it's a very playful idea and it gives you like a lot, there's a lot of fantasy stories. Like, you know, you got your Hobbit, you got the Lion of the Witch, where it's a portal fan. Like, it, you, there's a whole different world. And the idea with Harry Potter is that this, they are, it's a part, it's alongside our own world. And mm -hmm. like, I think that that bit where it's in between the cracks of things is like that's a very good case for why this story is the way that it is and why it's appealing. Like, while it is this kind of... It's like, it's both a mundane and fantastic... And, uh, like, world fantasy. Um, but yeah, and so... Uh, my magical moment is Ollivander's. And mm. I kind of went back and forth if this counts as a character or a magical moment. I think it's more... Like, to me, Ollivander is an event more than he is a character. And <laughs> he... Like, I think I thought, like, the wand lore, I like the detail in the wand lore. We talked about, you know, why it has issues. But, you know, when, in, within the scope of that scene, I find it very compelling. I like how he describes all the different wands as they have personalities. I like how weird and spooky he, he is and how he is kind of, like, the closest thing to a dark element we've gotten so far with magic. And it really, like, when, when I was a kid, that scene was like, ooh, shivers down my spine. And I, I mean, I mean, in effect, he is also selling weapons here. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. magic has like utilitarian purposes, but it's also something he needs to hurt people. Yeah, these are dangerous things that he deals with. He deals with very powerful and in in some hands dangerous magic, and you kind of got you have to be a little bit amoral to you know work with that. Uh all right. So and then. Uh, we're, we're going through these a little bit quickly, but that's because, like, we spent so much time uh, through these chapters. I think, like, there's a lot that we've already talked about. Uh, yeah. Now now we get to the last question, which is, what is the peak rowling moment of the week? And peak rowling, it can be many things. Uh, the way I described it last time, it feels like you got a quart of rowling injected into your eyeballs where you are feel very acutely aware that you are reading a book written by Rowling it, and it is 2021. And yeah. <laughs> and that could be something like both uh, just how she writes something as well as something within the story itself. Yeah, it, this can be something like this was like the goblin anti-Semitism would be a candidate for peak Rowling. A d another mm. candidate might be just a poorly chosen adverb. Uh, <laughs> And so it can get, it, it kind of depends where we're swaying today. 
I know you have something for this, uh, so I, I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you go ahead. My choice for a peak rallying moment is the sentence. Then something happened which made him jump about a foot in the air. Which, just especially in the context of the paragraph, just... I don't know, something about that sentence. I feel like if I was her editor, I'd look at that like, hmm, come see me. Oh, I see. Like, like it's not... Like, obviously, literally, that's not what happened. Uh, like, it's a, it's a very exaggerated uh, thing, or... Yeah, and also just like... <laughs> I, I, it's strange to describe something as like something happening which and then go straight into the metaphor of making you jump a foot in the air just mm. something about this doesn't quite work i see yeah it, it is kind of clunky like you have well i think it's like like something happened to me jump a foot in the air and then he gasps and then we then yes, we see yeah. what the thing is and it feels like if you just took out that sentence and just have him like he's reacting to the thing and there's a thing that would be more effective than just kind of yeah, basically it's a sentence that all, all it amounts to is then something surprising happened it was surprising it was the thing <laughs> and then we go into he gasped it was surprised and felt surprised it's yeah I, I see what you're saying <laughs> I remember I did that did kind of like like as I was reading it, it, it there was a kind of little like like record skip there of like hmm yeah. uh all right, I, I actually, I didn't quite have a good one for this, because, like, you have the goblins, but the goblins weren't as bad as I was expecting. Uh, I guess I, I sort of have two picks. One of them is, like, we have Seamus Finnegan, who has this very uh, leprechaun accent. I, I don't know if this, like, Rowling will sometimes swing for the fences when it comes to accents, and he has a bit where he said, like, me ma'am said, like, he, uh, like, it uses me, in the sentence in that kind of way and it's i i i i i'm not irish but i could imagine someone irish reading that and be like okay we don't all talk like that uh and Hello, then, i'm seamus finnegan i'm the only irish person in this school <laughs> uh i will be your irish person for the evening uh i'm not gonna try to do an irish accent um, <laughs> and then the other thing is Millicent Bullstrode or Bullstrode Millicent is made of Slytherin. Uh, this is, this is just the character name. And so like, this isn't even noteworthy yet, but I know who Millicent Bullstrode is and I know what she's like because we meet her like in the next book. She, she's not, she's a very minor character, but so we could do the I same. Mean, part of it is like, I keep on mishearing bullshit. <laughs> Bullstrode Millicent. Millicent Bullstrode. Now, we've already talked a bit about Rowling's naming powers, and, like, she gave us the gift of Cornelius Fudge, which paints you such a very clear and accurate picture of what this person is before we even meet them. Millicent Bullstrode. What kind of a person, what kind of girl do you think this is that is going to the evil house? Oh, I'm gonna guess not a very nice one. No, not a very nice one? Does she sound like... A delicate flower, a pixie girl with pigtails and a pink dress. No, no, I, I do kind of imagine, um, like, yeah, like, a really muscular girl in, like, German lederhosen is kind of what springs to mind. Yeah, would it be, uh, shocking to you if I told, like, she is, like, very muscular, very stocky, and has, like, a hard jaw that is noted. Uh, uh -oh. yeah. This is why I'm drawing attention to this, because that name, it, like, again, this is one line, one name, Bullstrode Millicent goes to Slytherin. But this is... <laughs> uh, is this the part where, like, if we could, we'd both look to camera? Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, and, like, you have, like, the other names. Hannah Abbott is Hufflepuff. Susan Bones is Hufflepuff. Lavender Brown is Gryffindor. Bullstrode Millicent is Slytherin. <laughs> it sounds like the it sounds like the name of a diesel engine. Right, exactly. And when we meet her, she is like you know, a, a very muscular, uh, stocky girl, not very feminine girl. Uh, and it, yeah, I Millicent Bullstrode. I hope you're doing all right. Like, 
I mean, she's going to the house for elitist shits, and that's kind of, that's the whole thing here. But that said, this is, yeah, what 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 is evil to Rowling? What is uh, someone who should be going to the evil house? And it is Millicent mm. Bulstrode. Uh, the other thing that strikes me is both of these names, I could believe, like, if I forgot the name of the boy who gets stuck in the chocolate tube in Willy Wonka, I, you could tell me it's either of those and I'd believe you. Cornelius Fudge or Millicent Bulstrode? Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah, this is... I got, like, the Roald Dahl... Roald Dahl was also quite good with names. Um, it seems to me... Is that, like, a British fantasist thing? I don't know. I, was, I don't know if I've ever quite seen names so, like richly drawn in the same way as this and it is like to the point where it gets made fun of like you're gonna be i guess yeah i guess we just have quite eccentric names in this country in general at times i suppose yeah like if, if you're making up uh, a british name it's always very like whimsical and stupid and yeah it's, yeah sorry i don't mean to be like but... ouch no, sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to like offend your national honor, but what what about the name Matt Muggletaint is silly to you? <laughs> Nothing. See, that's that's a very British name, and like Reba Mac and Cheese is a very evocative American name. Yeah. So I don't. <laughs> I think you've explained. Uh, we both explained our rallying moments. Yes. Uh, but so that those are that concludes the extracurriculars of this round. And we have, we have been going on for quite a while, so I think it's about time to wrap it up. Uh, but so yeah. for next time, we're we're going to be starting out with Potions Master, uh, and I think we're uh, are we taking this in threes or fours after this? Do you think? Because I have a feeling, like again, it, it's kind of breakneck from here to warn you, like. The chapters yeah. are about as thick as these have been when it comes to things to talk about. So I think taking it in threes may be the, the most we can do. That's probably an idea, yeah. So yeah, next time we'll be covering uh, three more chapters, starting with, yeah, Potions Master. We'll be getting into, like, actual life at Hogwarts. Uh, we hope you tune in for that. Yeah, so it's uh, Potions Master, Midnight Duel, and Halloween. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's a that's a solid chunk. But yeah, we hope you have enjoyed listening today. Uh, you can find the podcast itself is currently available on SoundCloud, but hopefully we'll be working on getting it onto more platforms in the near future. Uh, if you've enjoyed, please, please, please tell like friends who you think might also enjoy it. Uh, every listen helps. Yeah, and you can find the two of us at our socials. Um, Ruby, if you want to go first. Sure. I'm uh, Reba Mac and Cheese on Tumblr, Reba Mac and Cheese on Reddit. Uh, and you can also find me if you Google True Han Soul Rebel. That's True Han's Soul Rebel. You can find uh, associated works. Yeah. You can find me on Twitter at PRP Gecko. Uh, currently not working on any epic rock operas of my own, but. I like to think I tweet interesting things and have some fun insights if you would like to see them. But yeah, thank you for tuning in. I hope you have enjoyed the broadcast again and we'll be seeing you next time. Mischief Managed. Mischief Managed. Mischief Managed.